you guys sound incredible tonight. Let's just get right into it. Let's go to Matthew 16. We'll get the title of our lesson from this passage. Matthew 16 in verse 13. Give me an amen once you're there. I hope you're fired up to get into the Bible here tonight. Because that's what we're all about. We're a Bible church. So let's get into the word of God. Verse 13, Bible says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, I know this one. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. Saying he wasn't a very smart guy. God had to show it to him. But by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's an amazing passage we see. Jesus Christ was the coolest guy of all time. Here there at Caesarea Philippi. They also called it hell on earth. Or in other words, like Sin City. Just like Las Vegas. And just, just imagine this scene being in Sin City. Jesus with his disciples. And he asked them two questions. Who do the people say that I am? They're like, well, they're, they're like a prophet. You're like Elijah. You're like Moses. Awesome. Who do you think I am? And you don't want to be that kid in class that gets the obvious question wrong. So I can imagine all the disciples are like, oh, I don't want to raise my head. I'm, 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 I don't want to get it wrong. Peter was a bit impulsive. Amen. Got him good things sometimes, also got him bad things. But he's like, Jesus, I know this one. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You are God in the flesh. And Jesus says, I know you ain't. That's why God revealed that to you. But because of your courage, because of your boldness, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of God. And he says, you are Peter, which means little rock. But on this rock, the big rock, the Jesus Christ rock. He said, there's no foundation laid other than the one laid by Jesus Christ. He says, on this rock, on my compassion, on my conviction, on my zeal, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, hell cannot even stop it. And he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You see, the church should be like a mothership, should be like a train where if you want to get to heaven, don't miss the train here on earth. you got to get in the kingdom, here on earth, to one day be there in heaven. You know, I think as men, we love to build things. I, I was an engineering major, and I love to get my hands on some things and build some things for to greater humanity or for a greater whatever cost. But I think in the world that we live in, men are focusing on building the wrong things building their own name, building their own house, building their own financial gain. Some are even building their body count. Some are just building their own pleasure. But here tonight, as the men of God, we've made a decision to echo the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in this passage, that we're going to echo and say, I will build my church. And that's the title of the lesson here tonight. I will build my church. Are you excited to build the house of God here tonight? That's what we came here to do. We're not here just to play church. We're not here just to come together on a Wednesday night. We are here 
to build the house of God. Tonight we're going to look at three different foreshadowings in the Old Testament of the church to get our three points. The first foreshadowing we're going to see is Noah's Ark. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 6. If you don't know what I mean, I hope you know after we're done with the lesson. We're going to go to the beginning, the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 6. Give an amen when you're there. Amen. amen. Our first point. I will build my church because it is the only hope. Genesis 6 in verse 9. The Bible says this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. It was amazing. We see, in reality, the second fall of mankind. Where well, the first one was Adam and Eve, but then hear what happens during the times of Noah. Every single man, every single woman, the Bible says their hearts were sinful all the time, full of violence. And it just, it broke the heart of God. And he tells Noah, the only hope for them is if you build this ark. You build it because the flood is coming. And the flood is going to destroy every single person on earth. But only if they listen to you, only if they listen to me, they can have they could get in the ark and be saved. And he tells Noah, you, you build it. Now, so sometimes we could read the Old Testament and think, like, this is just some fairy tales. How does this apply to me in the 21st century? Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter 3, verse 18. What is Noah's ark? What does the flood, what does all of that, what does that mean? First Peter 3, verse 18 will teach us. The Bible says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, that, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Over here, Peter talks about the days of Noah. And he says that during that time, that water symbolized baptism. So what does that teach us? Yusuf alluded to it in his short charge, to short charge for benevolence. He said that the Old Testament is a physical foreshadowing of spiritual realities. This scripture clearly teaches that. Where it said that water was a symbol, it doesn't say baptism is a symbol. Now we live in a world where people say, yeah, baptism is our sign of inward grace. You would never find that phrase in the scriptures. Some of you say, yeah, baptism is a public declaration of your faith. You would never find that phrase in the scriptures. 
you, what we see here, it says that the water of Noah symbolized baptism. That now saves you also. In a real way, that water washed away all the sinners. But then also saved Noah and his family. And it says that God waited patiently during this time. In the second book of Peter, 2 Peter, it calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And if you look at the account in Genesis, Noah preached for 120 years. Why did he preach for that time? Because this scripture says God was patient and Noah was patient. And he wanted the people to come into the ark. And the ark is supposed to represent the church. Because when you get baptized, you get baptized into Christ's body. Christ's body over here in the days of Noah represented by the ark. And when they were in their ark, they were in Christ. Then they landed on Mount Ararat over there, which means the promised land, heaven one day. And that's where the church is headed. That's where we're going. It's the only hope back then in Genesis 6. And it's the only hope in the 21st century. It says that the world was full of violence. Nothing has changed. The world is still, in our modern day, is full of violence. It's full of strife. It's full of slavery. It's full of addiction. It's full of all these terrible, detestable vices that are keeping people away from God. And the only hope, if they hear the disciples of Jesus Christ preaching for however long God wants us to preach, that the only hope, get in the ark. Because he judged it back then with water. But one day, he's going to judge the world with fire. And when that happens, you're either going to be fired up or burnt up. And the only hope when that time comes is if you're in the church. You know, Jason preached an amazing lesson at staff, for those who were there. And he shared a, a, a story that just makes you just, just tremble. He, sto- he shared a story about a man in Ohio who lined up his three little boys, ages three, four, and seven, and shot them dead execution style. And they're just there on the floor. One tried to run away. But then still, he hunted him down and got him. And I went back and I I watched the video. It's so disturbing. This stuff is happening. What if that man just got reached out to? What, what What if that man just... Got a chance to seek God with all of his heart. That could have changed his whole family. That's what the church's message is. It's the only hope. No amount of therapy, no amount of self-help is going to save people. We have to understand that our, that's our message, is to save the world. We're not really here to change it. It's doomed already. But we're here to save it just like Noah. 120 years. Can you imagine the pain that man went through? Seeing people he loved just say no and no for 120 years. We get down when someone says no for us for one semester. That guy got no's for 120 years. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to get in that ark. I want to keep doing what I think is right. And yet, he was still patient, just like God. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll build my church because it's the only hope. Let's see the heart of God, 2 Peter 3, verse 8. The Bible says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, 
and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise to some to understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Here we see the heart of God where he says he's patient and wants everyone to come to repentance. And it's amazing where it says a thousand years could be like a day and a thousand and a day like a thousand years. And the heart of God is he wants all mankind to come to an order of truth and be saved. But just think about that. That's the heart of God. And yet the majority of the world says no to him. And every second, God has to see people he loves not grab onto his hand and not be saved. Now, this, this month is a very interesting month for myself as it is, was my, my, my birthday month, amen. Turned 28 in the campus. I guess I'm the old guy now. But with the others, I'm still... Fairly young. Got, I, got, I got nothing on Brian over there. Brian, Brian is, uh, he's a young, he, Brian looks very young, but he's kind of up there. Huh? <laughs> you never guess it. You know, Asians just don't age. It's crazy. And also, you know, black don't crack. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but my knees are cracked. It's a prayer for my knees. I mean. it's, 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 it was awesome to celebrate and reflect. But it's also a tough time as also his Father's Day. And today is, was supposed to be my father's birthday. And as you know, my, my, my father did pass away in 2018. And this is a time when, you know, today, it's, it's to be open, it's always, it's always hard. Even though it was years ago, this doesn't not get easy. And the other day, I was just reflecting on, honestly, the, the, the day he died. I was in a follow-up study with Esteban, and... I got called that he has less than a couple hours to live. I drove down from San Jose to Wilden Hills, but by the time I got there, he was already unconscious. And I could talk to him, and they told me that he could hear me, but he couldn't talk back to me. And just to see my father go, I can never forget that pain. And also knowing that I studied with him and he didn't want to be a disciple. And I was thinking about it, I was praying, I was like, wow. That pain that I felt, someone I love so much, God feels that every second. Every second. Someone dies. And God, as Jesse preached very eloquently on Sunday, made them in his image, and he has to watch them perish. How much does that hurt the heart of God? That's why he came down from heaven, died so that he could provide atonement, give people an opportunity to be saved. But now, he's counting on us. He's counting on us to say, you know what, God? You did your part. You died for me, and now I'm going to die for you and for others. And I'm going to make a decision and know everyone has a father. Everyone has a brother. Everyone has a sister. Everyone has an uncle. Everyone has a friend. That's why we need to be the ones that bring hope. That's why we are just like Noah. The preachers of righteousness. Just like Noah, we want to say, get away from the flood. It's coming. The ark is ready. I will build my church because it is the only hope to save this lost world. That's who we are. That's why we go and share our faith. I want to challenge us here tonight. One, if you're, if you're a guest, it's time to get in the ark. It's, it's time, if, it, if you've been in the ark and you walked out of the ark, it's time to restore yourself back in the ark. But for those who are studying, make a decision. Do you really think the world has something to offer you that's going to fulfill you? It's a fallacy. It's a flood. Run away. Now for us as disciples, 
I think in the Metro Coast, I can say, things have slowed down a bit. Have we forgotten the flood? That we're still here as preachers of righteousness, even in the summer? We don't take breaks from God. There ain't no summer break as the disciple. We're always preaching because we know this is the only hope. Let's go out and have a fruitful summer. If you haven't gone to the waters of baptism with someone to help someone to be in the States, it's time to get back to that. Because you, my brothers, are the only hope for this lost and dying world. Are you guys with me over here? <laughs> Let's get to our second point. And our second foreshadowing. Nehemiah's wall. Point number two. I will build my church because it is my real family. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 4. It is hot up here, man. I'm, I'm burning like 3,000 calories. Pray for me. It's my, it's my whole calorie intake for the week. That's, that's how I just stay fit. I don't work out. I just go preach. <laughs> Amen. So we understand Nehemiah 4 takes place in 466 BC. And what happens in 536... The Jewish slaves are then free from the Cyrus the Liberator, or they're freed from Babylon by the Liberator Cyrus, and they build the Temple of God again in about 20 to 25 years. And yet they never build the wall until 466. If you do the math, that's about 70 years. Nehemiah hears this, and he gets so troubled. And he has a request to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And I believe in this passage we're reading in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13, gives us insight on one of the most important convictions that Nehemiah had to inoculate in the people's hearts was being real family. Nehemiah 4, verse 13. Bible says, Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. It's amazing right here where we see Nehemiah. He stations them by families. Because he knows that what will a man not do for his family? He will fight tooth and nail. A man defending his family is better than any hired army. And he says, go by family. And he, he tells them and inspires them, fight for your family. And then it says that after they do this, they finish the wall in 52 days. Think about that. They couldn't do it for 70 years. But then they do it in 52 days. Because they had a conviction that the brother next to them, the woman next to them, the little children next to them, they weren't just strangers. They were their family members. Isaiah 26 teaches us that the kingdom of God's walls will be its salvation. And we understand how we get salvation. Faith, repentance, and baptism. And then now you are in Christ. You are in that wall. So the wall over here does represent the church. It's protected by the wall of salvation. It's not the name that saves you. Not just because you're in the ICC doesn't mean you're saved. Those who hold on to the teachings of Jesus Christ, those are the true sold out disciples of Jesus. But it's amazing here where we see a conviction that's throughout the whole Bible. Fight for your families. Like, do we really see the brothers next to us as our family? Not even just the brothers next to us. The brothers in foreign lands. They're also your family. First, let's learn chapter 4. You have to turn there. In verse 10, it says, In fact, you do love all of God's family. Throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you to do so more and more. I, I know the Metro, I know you guys love each other. I know that you guys are family. But there's levels to it. 
more and more, ever increasing and going from strength to strength. And, you know, I'm tomorrow flying out to Atlanta for a family reunion. And it's always interesting going and being around my family. Femi knows this. Nigerian parents are just, they don't, they don't play games. <laughs> when I told them I'm going to full-time ministry, I became the black sheep in my family. We're like, you can't make money. Why aren't you making money? Because I, I want to answer the call of God, that's why. But, and, and they know, too, who my real family is. They know that you guys are my real family. I will die for you guys. That was the decision I made when I said Jesus is Lord. But it goes both ways. I hope you will die for me too. <laughs> and special missions is an opportunity to say, this is my real family. It's an opportunity to say, I will build my church because it is my real family. Can you imagine if your family member was sick and needed, this paper's falling apart, needed thousands of dollars. I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. Needed thousands of dollars for a surgery. You're going to find the money. Even if you're broke, you're going to figure it out. So missions is never, doesn't make you struggle. It exposes your struggle. It exposes that you don't really see this as your family. At this time, you could pull out the sheet that you have. Hopefully, you're still there, not under your feet. If not, I'm sure there's others around. Over here, we did it before, we're doing it again. We want us to have a conviction. Why are we giving special missions? 31 churches being planted in 2023. I mean, to name of some, name some of them, Lincoln, Nebraska. Eric and Gabby are planning that. I used to disciple Eric. And it's amazing to see him now be going to plant a church for the Lord. That's my brother. Wyoming. Nick and Rachel are planning that. Matthew reached out to Nick, I think, or Christianos, actually Christianos. <laughs> uh, but that's our brother. In Thailand, Vladdy and Cello. They're planning the church in Bangkok, Thailand. That's our uncle, that's our auntie. And in Ghana, which they're already there. Kwaku and Ashley and the team are planning the church over there in Ghana. And there's their little babies, Ama. Ama Lama, three years, had her first birthday in another continent. That's where your missions is going. That's why we don't struggle with missions. That's why for the campus, when they saw, hey, 950, there was like, hey, man, let's do it. When the single saw 1250, they're like, hey, man, let's do it. When the marriage saw 1250 each, they were like, whoa, but hey, man, let's do it. Because we will build the church because it is a real family for the Lord. That's why we're doing it. But I think at times you just got to have some straightforward talks with the family. Our goal for mission for LA Church, $1.1 million. You see, if you're a guest here, we have no issue talking about money. Because we know where every single dollar is going. Hey, I'm a minister of the church, you come to my home, and you know none of us are rich. We're doing this so that we can save some more souls. So every single dollar matters. 1.1 million, and for the West, their goal 
of that $1.1 million is $67,000. And for the Southland, our portion was $90,000. And right now, for the whole church, for the whole LA church, we're about $60,000 away from hitting this goal. In the West, out of 67000 already turned in 65000 Just $2,000 away. The West is going to blow up their special mission there, man. The Southland, out of that 90000 we've turned in about 80000 We're $10,000 away, but I believe the Southland is going to blow out their missions. I believe it. Do you believe it? Do you want to see the nations won? Do you want to see the world won in this generation? All right, let's now put our money where our mouth is. We're asking every single member, if they can, to give above and beyond. For the merits, we're asking to give $300 over their goal. Regina and I already did that. Matt and Selma already did that. Jason, Kit, already have done that. So for the marriage, we're asking $300 over. For the campus and the singles, we're asking for those who already blew up their goal and those who gave a pledge to give $200 above. And I believe, just as we all yelled and screamed for World Evangelists, I believe as we all just said, that we want to see the world won. In this generation, we're going to blow it out. On Sunday, it's a definitive moment for this church. But you understand, guys, what we're trying to do hasn't been done since the first century. Why haven't they done it? Because of the sacrifice. And when the rubber met the road, people just didn't answer the call. And say, you know what? This church is not really my real family. But I know, with the deepest of convictions, that when it comes on special mission Sunday, this Sunday, when that sheet is up there and whoever's going to read it, probably Jason or Raul, we're going to see the heart of the City of Angels Church. And we're going to have a loud shout of victory. Because we said, I will build my church because this is my real family. One final point. Very quickly. Our third foreshadowing. Solomon's temple. Point number three. I will build my church because it glorifies God. First Chronicles chapter 29. Thank you. Got my full name there. You said it great too. First Chronicles 29, <clears throat> verse 1. You guys there? I will build my church because it glorifies God. Verse 1 says, Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. Yes. Amen. I can relate. Yeah. The task is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources, I have provided for the temple my God. Go for the gold work silver for the silver, and bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble. All these things in not small quantities, large quantities. You see, David went above and beyond the goal. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and above Everything I have provided for this holy temple, 
I provided for this holy temple 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings, for the gold work and the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? I'll build my church because it glorifies God. It's just so awesome, this scene where David, in his final days, he wanted what no man ever did in the Old Testament. He said, God, you've been living in this tabernacle. Why don't we build a house for you so that you could live there? But God said, you know, not you, David, but your son will build it. And yet David's heart was not selfishly ambitious. He says, even though I can't build a house, I will prepare to build a house. And he gathers all his resources, all the gold, all the silver, his, his own personal possessions, things like his Xbox or his PS5, and says, I'm going to give it over to the Lord. Maybe his Jordans as well. I'm going to give it over to the Lord. I remember, I sold my Jordans for special missions, amen. So that, was, that was hard for me, but I did it. <laughs> but he gave that because you know, he said, you know what? This is not for man. This is for you see, what we do, seeking and saving the lost, what we do when we go into a Bible study, what we do when we see someone get baptized, us building the church of God right now, is not for you. It's not for Jason. It's not for Kip. This is for God. It glorifies God. And the people have that deep in their heart. They're going to make it to the end. Because that is what's going to accomplish the mission. Your zeal won't accomplish it. My zeal won't accomplish it. But the zeal of the Lord will accomplish and finish the temple of the living God here in the 21st century, and that is God's church. Here's the thing. People sacrifice for us. Now it's time to sacrifice for others. 42 disciples, 2007, came down to plant the seed of Angel's church. From 2007, now, in 2023, over 11,000 disciples all around the world. All those men, all those women, they made a decision to sacrifice. They made a decision to say, I will be the one that will consecrate myself. Now the question is today, as the men of God, who's willing to consecrate themselves? Who's willing to say, I want to be now those who in the future are going to stand on my shoulders and say, you know what? Thank God, Eric. Thank God that Eric said, I will build my church. Thank God that Federico over there at UCLA said, you know what? I'm going to build my church. Thank God that Offa. Offa said, you know what? I've been here since 1992, but still, I want to build my church. I want to build God's church, because I know that it glorifies our God. Let's close out in Acts 20. Our three points. I'll build my church because it's the only hope. Point number one. Point number two, I'll build my church because it's my real family. And point number three, I'll build my church because it glorifies God. That's why we've come to build the church. Acts 20, verse 28. We close with this passage. The Bible says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The Bible says that Jesus Christ bought you at a price. The price wasn't 950. The price wasn't 1250. The price wasn't 1.1 million dollars. The price was his own blood. He bought you with his death. In the famous kingdom song, Battle Hymn of the Republic, 
It said, Jesus died to make men holy. So let us die to make men free. That's the challenge. That's the call. And I know we're all going to echo the words. I will build my church. And to God be the glory. <laughs>